thought I'd start with teaching. And let me ask you, how many of you are planning to be teachers or are teachers? How many of you? Okay, and the rest of you, what are you going to do? Lawyers? Social workers? Lawyers? Come on. I got one son who's a lawyer, and I got a wife who's a lawyer. You could, do, you could be a teacher if you work harder. No, I'm just kidding. Um, all right, I'm going to speak. I'm going to speak about education. And even if you're not going to be a teacher, I think it's relevant to the debates going on in this country and the political moment that we're living through. But I really am uh, terribly interested in convincing some of you to go into teaching, which I think is the loftiest and most interesting profession that one can choose. Um, and I started teaching in 1965, and I'll tell you a quick story about that. I started teaching in 1965 in a small um, freedom school, preschool associated with the Black Freedom Movement. Um, it was also affiliated with Head Start. And I was uh, teaching, I was like 15 minutes into my first class when a five-year-old kid said to me, Bill, why does the ball bounce? And I thought, oh shit, I don't even know that. You know, I've been teaching for 15 minutes and I don't, and this five-year-old has stumped me. <laughs> By the end of the first of, of, of the morning, the, I was stumped completely. I mean, every kid had a question I couldn't answer. Why is your skin pink and my skin's brown? I didn't know that. Why is the sky blue? I didn't know that. Why is that man sleeping on the gutter? I didn't know that. I was lucky when they said, why is the floor sticky when I spill apple juice? I knew the answer to that, and I was so relieved to know something. But it sent me into a crisis, and the crisis was, it goes to the very heart of how I think about teaching and education. The crisis was, what does it mean to be a teacher? Because I thought, at the age of 20, that being a teacher was standing at the podium, master and commander of the, of the ship, having the answers to anything that would come up. And it took me a couple of years to develop a different metaphor for teaching. And I think it's appropriate to talk about tonight because it's a metaphor about teaching in a democracy. And I think Antonio articulated it very, very well. The idea in a democracy is that you discover that the teacher isn't the know-it-all and the authority in front of the class, but the teacher is on a voyage of discovery and surprise with his or her students that the trick isn't to know everything, the trick is to know how to develop a curriculum of questions. So keep that in mind, a curriculum of questioning, a curriculum of wondering, a curriculum of investigation. Think about it for a minute. Every school system you can name, every modern school system you can name, medieval Saudi Arabia, um, apartheid South Africa, fascist Italy, communist Albania, and the United States, all of those school systems want their kids to learn the subject matters, do their homework, show up on time, stay away from drugs, don't have a kid, you know, stay focused on your learning. We want that and they want that. But that raises a question for me. What makes education in a democracy different, fundamentally different, than education in any of those autocratic or authoritarian systems? Is there anything that makes education here or in any, demo any democratic society different than education in an, in an authoritarian society. And I will argue tonight, and we can go back and forth about this, that there's a fundamental difference. And the difference is this, that in a democracy, we take as an article of faith that every human being is of incalculable value. Every human being is of incalculable value. And we see that, that value in the, in each human being who comes before us. That means that we try to develop an educational system in which the fullest development of each is the condition for the full development of all. And simultaneously, the full development of all is the condition for the fullest development of each. This is fundamental in a democracy, and it makes us different than education in an authoritarian system. What, and, and let's admit, we are a flawed, partial, incomplete, maybe aspirational democracy, but we're not a finished democracy. We're a democracy in progress, and we're a democracy in need of repair, as every society is, as every human construction is. Okay, so if we take this as the starting point, this has huge implications for policy. For example, I think you'd all agree with me, racial segregation is wrong. It's wrong because every human being is of incalculable value and the full development of all is the condition for the fullest development of each. So racial segregation is wrong. Also class segregation is wrong. These things are not 
Uh, so it's wrong in Chicago, for example, to have one school where kids go to, go to a school where they, they, uh, where they go to school on $40,000 per kid per year. That's what it costs for a kid to go to school in one school. And three miles down the road, the kid is going to school on $4,000 per kid per year. That's wrong in a democracy. That's what Jonathan Kozo called savage inequalities. That's, that's the kind of thing that's, what, what we are saying to children then is, our policy towards children is simple. Choose the right parents. Like you all were brilliant, you chose the right parents, correct? I mean, look, you got here, and you had a good school, decent neighborhood, blah, 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 not every one of you is exactly the same, but pretty much you chose the right parents. But if you chose the wrong parents, then you go to a school which is falling down around your ears, which is overcrowded, and so on. Do you see the distinction I'm trying to make? Jonathan Coastal calls this savage inequalities. In fact, I'd go so far as to say, in a democracy, whatever the most um, privileged and wisest parents want for their children, that's what we as a community should want for all of our children. We want for all of our children what the wisest and most privileged parents have for theirs. So let's just take an example. Arnie Duncan, the Secretary of Education, went to the University of Chicago Laboratory Schools for 12 years. Um, that's where he got his education from kindergarten through 12th grade. The Obama kids went to the University of Chicago Laboratory Schools. And full disclosure, when I moved to Chicago, my kids went to the University of Chicago Laboratory Schools. What did they find there? They found classes that were capped at 18. No class could be larger than 18 kids. They found well-resourced classrooms. They found a curriculum based in part on pursuing their own interests and following their own questions. They found a teacher corps that was not only well-respected, but unionized. Horrors. Can you imagine? The Obama kids and Arnie Duncan went to a school that was unionized. And that was good enough for them. But when it comes to the kids on the west side of Chicago, the Secretary of Education and the President have said, it's OK if class size is 37. Not OK for my kids, but OK for other people's kids. In a democracy, that's not fair, and it's not good, and it's not a way to look toward the future, hopefully. So when the Obamas moved from, from Chicago to Washington, there was great speculation in the press. Where would they go to school? Where would they go to school? And of course, they went to a school just like the University of Chicago Laboratory Schools. Small class size, full arts program, full physical education program, teachers who were respected, a curriculum based in part on asking questions. And if it's good enough for them, that ought to be the standard that we pose for everybody. Why? Because we believe in the incalculable value of every human being. We believe that we are equal. We also believe that we are the sovereign. That is, we're not training an elite to run the world. We are the sovereign. We are the powerful. And in order to be powerful, you have to be educated. In order to be educated, what the wisest and most powerful have and the, and the most privileged, we ought to all have. There was a story in the New York Times earlier this week. You might have seen it. <clears throat> right here. It's got a list of all the big school reformers today, from Bill Gates to Michelle Reed to Jeff Bush to Davis Cunningham. And it talks about where they went to school. And guess what? Every one of them went to a private school where they had small class size and a, and a respected teacher corps and so on. And what is shocking about the article is how their own early experiences don't become the measure of what they'd like for other people's children would become the opposite of what they want for other people's children. So this notion that we live in a democracy, which we can argue about, and we could, we could discuss and take apart a little bit, but this notion, to me, has huge implications for how we do school policy, how we do access, how we do equity. And I think we're failing badly in that, and I think we have to get better. But the second implication of the notion that in a democracy, every human being is of incalculable value, is a curriculum and teaching question. And in a, on, a, on the level of curriculum and teaching, in an authoritarian or autocratic system, whatever else they teach, math, music, uh, language arts, literature, whatever else they teach, there's a hidden curriculum. And the hidden curriculum is obedience and conformity. Whatever else we teach in fascist Italy or fascist Germany, Whatever else we teach in medieval Saudi Arabia, we are teaching obedience and we are teaching conformity. 
Find your place in the social hierarchy. Go there, sit down, shut up, and pay attention. That is the opposite of what we ought to be teaching in a democracy. In a democracy, the hidden curriculum ought to be, whatever else we teach, it ought to be, we ought to also be teaching the values of initiative, courage, imagination, entrepreneurship. These are values that, that power a democratic society. Without imagination, without initiative, without courage, without developing a mind of your own, how can you participate fully in the public world, in the public life? And so, again, in a democracy, what we want to look to is the idea of a curriculum that encourages imagination and, and, and initiative and courage. So once again, to make the contrast, I get very irritated, mostly with the New York Times, but with a lot of other things, but I get irritated when I see on the front page of the New York Times a picture of a little African-American girl, front page, looking into, she's on a farm, and she's looking into a pig pen. And the headline is, trip to the farm may increase test scores. And I'm, I'm like, wait a minute, you mean that Malia and Sasha O'Brien <coughs> wouldn't go to the farm if it didn't increase their test scores, and they wouldn't go to a play, or the opera, or the beach, or you know, a vacation in Hawaii, or camping? Of course not. But the, what the most privileged have for their children, we want for all of our children. We want them to have access to the arts. We want them to have access to physical education, and so on. And one of the things that I encourage with my students, and I'll encourage with you, is that we ought to, in schools in, and in universities, in colleges, encourage a curriculum not so much of taking in what already exists, but of asking questions of the world. I said it earlier, a curriculum of questioning. That's how you develop a mind of your own. You ask questions. Let me give you a serious example of a curriculum of questioning, and then I'll give you a couple of silly ones. The silly ones I thought of myself, of course. Um, a serious one. During the black freedom movement of the 1950s and 60s and 70s, during the civil rights movement, there was a period, you know, the myth that we tell ourselves about the civil rights movement is it has a neat narrative arc. It started and there was a bus boycott and a guy who had a dream and he was brilliant, he made us all better and now the world is terrific. Well, that story is largely, you know, a myth. The truth is it was always as life is now, the best of times and the worst of times. It was a time of confusion. Nobody knew exactly what to do. In 1963, the movement had entered into a period of very, uh, in the movement in the South, it entered into a lull. Nobody knew what to do. There wasn't clear that the energy was going to continue. And a young volunteer from the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, which was the organization that led the bus boycotts and the, and the uh, the, I mean, the freedom rides, not the bus boycotts, the freedom rides and the lunch counter sit-ins. young volunteer named Charlie Cobb proposed the creation of a set of freedom schools to re-energize the movement for civil rights. And what he said was, he wrote a proposal, one and a half page proposal, and he said in the proposal, the black people of Mississippi have been denied many things. Fully, uh, fully trained teachers, adequate facilities, forward-looking curriculum, but the fundamental injury is they've been denied the right to think for themselves about the circumstances of their lives and how they could be otherwise. Think about that. The fundamental injury is they've been denied the right to think for themselves about the circumstances of, the, of their lives and how they might be otherwise. That was a revolutionary thing to say in Mississippi in 1963. In fact, the three famous martyrs of Mississippi, Goodman, Schwerner, and Cheney, were freedom school teachers, and they were kidnapped and lynched investigating the burning of a freedom school. So this was a pretty incendiary thing to propose, but Cobb proposed it. And then they went on, and I, as I said, this first school I was involved in was affiliated with this effort. They, they went on to develop a curriculum, and you can find it online. It's called the Mississippi Freedom School Curriculum 1964. And the curriculum is a curriculum of questions. Why, 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 why? Why are you in the freedom movement? Why am I in the freedom movement? What is it we hope to accomplish? How did we get to where we are today? Where would we like to go? What does the majority culture have that we want? What do we want that we want to keep? On and on and on, 24 pages of questions. Here's the Bill of Rights. Does it apply to everybody? Should it? What does free speech mean? Should we be able to say anything we want, anytime we want? And so on. 
This led to an explosion of interest in learning, and not just learning as a set of skills, but learning as a way to understand society and your place in it. Learning as a way to become socially literate, not just technically literate, politically literate, not just you know baseline literate. And that is an education for democracy. That's an education which changes the way you think about yourself. And if you think about that pivotal sentence in Charlie's proposal, it applies equally today to the kids on the west side of Chicago or kids in the schools of Rochester. Incidentally, Chicago just inherited your school superintendent, so you have to send us a thank you note. Um, I'm not sending you a thank you note, but you sent me a thank you note. Um, in any case, uh, you know, the, the, if you applied it to the kids in downtown Rochester or the kids in Chicago, these kids have been denied many things. In Chicago, the second graders have 37 kids in their classes. That's outrageous. You can't teach and you can't learn in that situation. 37, you know, seven-year-olds just doesn't work. So, you know, that's part of the problem, as Charlie said. But the deeper problem is, where is the curriculum that, asks, that invites you, encourages you, to ask the questions of the universe like, how did I get here? What does it mean to be human in the 21st century? What are my goals and aspirations? What are my responsibilities to others? And what are their responsibilities to me? These are the kinds of questions that an educated person, someone who's not just an educated fool, but somebody who actually is an educated person capable of participating in this complex social life we call a democracy. That's the education we aspire to. So a curriculum of questioning is what I think you know, we should all be pushing toward, we should be wondering about, and it, co it goes for college and university as well. Not simply learning what is, but asking questions about what could be and what should be. That's what makes an educated person. I'll give you one other example, a silly one. You know who, um, what's his first name? Um, Huckabee, what's his first name? Mike. Governor Michael Huckabee, right. Um, Mike Huckabee, he's the governor of Arkansas. He's running for president of the United States on the Republican ticket. He's in the primary race, I think, or maybe not. But he's in all the polls. Um, is Donald Trump going to beat him? That's the question of the day. I don't know. Um, but Huckabee was the governor of Arkansas, and you may know or you may not know that he was a very large man, and he lost an enormous amount of weight. Did you know that? He, he, he was once very big. He lost about 200 pounds, and he became kind of the poster child for dramatic weight loss. And to his credit, he's been an advocate against childhood obesity, which is, you know, a useful thing. Him and Michelle Obama united uh, on the childhood obesity question. Um, in any case, you might not know this, that in Arkansas, um, the school system, the school board decided that um, on your report card, they would list not only your math, English, you know, social studies and history, but they would put your body mass index on your report card. Did you know that? So you take your report card home, you have an A in English, a C in math, and you're fat. Um, <laughs> you know, and uh, that's a shock. Um, and, and uh, you know, kind of shocking. But what I, what I like about a curriculum of questioning is it applies to everything. So I like to think that if I were a teacher in Arkansas, I would say to my students, let's investigate this. Let's ask a bunch of questions. For example, What's the record of these kinds of reforms changing behavior? If we put something like this on a report card or in the curriculum, what's the record of it changing behavior in other instances? What's the state of our physical education department, uh, uh, departments around the state? What's the state of our parks? What's the state of our after-school athletics? Who owns the franchise to the lunchroom and the snack bar and why? And what, what about fresh fruits and vegetables? Are they available in the school or in the bodegas and shops around the school? I don't know the answer to any of those questions, but that's what a curriculum of questioning means. It means opening your eyes to everything that's in front of you and interrogating it. And, what it, and most fundamentally it means, and this is what Charlie Cobb's whole point was in the Freedom Schools, most fundamentally it means, and, I, and this is a lesson for you as well as for others, you don't need permission to interrogate the world. You have an absolute right to interrogate the world, and you don't need to ask anybody, is it okay if I read this book, or listen to this speaker, or go to this place, or have this event, or see this movie? No, you don't need those questions. You don't need the 
ask permission. All you need to do is follow your own interest, curiosity, initiative, courage, and find out. And the interesting thing about a curriculum of questioning is that it's bottomless. Why is it bottomless? Because we live in an infinite and expanding universe. What you know, and I don't care who you are, me, you, everybody in this room, what we know is this much of what exists in an infinite universe. We know this much. Now we use this, you know, to kind of leverage against the mountain of stuff that we don't know, but we don't know a lot. And frankly, there's a lot of ways you, you can show that American education in particular is actually weakens us in certain areas. For example, you may know this, but National Geographic did a survey of 18 to 25 year old American kids, y'all, and they gave them blank world maps, and 80% couldn't find Iraq, 80% couldn't find Israel, Palestine, 40% couldn't find Great Britain, and 10% couldn't find the United States. <laughs> that one makes us laugh, because damn it, we could find the United States, and we're pretty proud of that, and I am too. But, okay, if you can find the United States, good for you. How about draw your freehand sketch of Bahrain? Oops, not so easy. Um, how about a freehand sketch of Iraq with the major cities and the surrounding countries? How about the major battles? We've only been there 10 years. Why should you know? But it's part of the miseducation that we don't know. And we're famous the world around for not knowing geography and not knowing history. We are famous. I'm not putting us down. I'm just saying these are some of the gaps that we can kind of wonder about. What are we not seeing? And it leads me to kind of the last couple of points I want to make. I guess I'll start this way. You all are against slavery, right? You're against slavery, right? Yes. How about a little affirmish? Yeah. 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 A little louder, okay? Yes. Yes. Okay, yes. some of you aren't, but most of you are against <laughs> slavery, right? Okay. Good for you. Um, and if you were against slavery 160 years ago, you'd have been against the law, the founders, the Constitution, the Bible, your preacher, your parents, custom, common sense, and a lot else. But you would have been, right? Well, who knows? Let's hope we would. Let's say yes. Everybody in this room would have been running the Underground Railroad right up to Canada through northern New York. Good for us. Okay, that's pretty good. We, we have consensus. And y'all are for a woman's right to vote, right? Yes. Not just the women. Come on, dude. Let's get yeah. it's just a little I hear the women applauding and the men. I'm not so sure. It's not for <laughs> Of course you're for a woman's right to vote. And you're for a woman's right to vote because it's common sense now, and it's easy now. And 100 years ago, if you were for a woman's right to vote, you were a screaming radical, and you were probably a woman who was, you know, uh, the, all the things they say about women. You know, you were probably an hysterical woman who was self-justifying it. But today we're for it. But if you've been against, you, if you've been for it 110, 120 years ago, you would have been against the Bible, the founders, Common sense, the Constitution, your preacher, your parents, your friends, everybody except your sister. Okay, so I'm just saying, it's easy for us to know what to do then. The question is, are your eyes open now? And this is the responsibility of being a citizen in a democracy. It's the responsibility of teachers. In fact, this is the responsibility of being an ethical person, a moral actor in the world today. That is, you have to be willing and able to open your eyes, not to keep your eyes shut, but to open your eyes to reality. And that's easier to say than to do it. I'll come back to it. Opening your eyes is the first step. Acting is the second step. Doubting is the third step. And then back to the beginning. Open your eyes, act and doubt. This is what it means to be a citizen. Now let's just talk a minute about opening your eyes. It's easier to say than to do. And I use the example of slavery and women's rights because it's so easy to see in retrospect. But at the time, it's not easy to say. So 40 years from now, what will your granddaughter say to you? 50 years from now, what will your granddaughter say to you about you going to the College of Brockport? She'll say to you, Grandma, is it true that when you were in college that, let's just start with the, the first African American was elected president, that if things work out well, you can say yes. Not only that, I was in D.C. on the mall, I was in Chicago, you could lie. It's 50 years from now. Um, and then she'll say, but Grandma, is it true it cost him close to a billion dollars to run that campaign? And you'll say, really? Yeah, I just read it in the history book. A billion dollars to get elected president. And you call that democracy? 
and you'll say something like, well, I think you raised it on the internet, and she'll say, you're an idiot. You know, because, uh, I mean, I'm not saying that'll happen. I'm just saying it could happen. It could happen. There are things you don't see, I don't see, because they're common sense. Of course elections cost money. Of course tech things are advertised on TV. Why shouldn't they be? You don't see cigarette ads on TV, right? Do you? No, they're illegal. But we see, we see McDonald's advertised on TV. That's common sense, right? And beer ads and stuff coming out of the iPhone. Have you seen those? You can get an app on your iPhone with a chorus beer. Never mind. Um, I don't want to encourage you. Um, but you see my point. My point is that there are things you're not seeing that are right in front of you. So for example, your granddaughter asks you, is it true that there were 2.4 million of your fellow citizens in prison, the largest prison population in the world when you were at the College of Brockport? And again, you'll say, really? I didn't know that. Well, you do know it now. So what are we not seeing? What are we ignoring? What are we not paying attention to? And why is our attention so easily dragged over here, but not over there? I'm thinking suddenly of this book, Blindness, by Jose Saramago, the Nobel laureate from Portugal. If you don't know it, it's a brilliant book. It, it's, um, I'll tell you quickly. Um, it opens, the opening paragraph, a man is sitting in traffic in a modern European city at rush hour, stopped at a stoplight, and suddenly he goes blind. And someone helps him from his car, gets him home, somebody else steals his car, and his wife takes him to a clinic, and everyone in the clinic has mysteriously gone blind. And, you know, they're, they're kind of, they don't know what to do with these people, so they quarantine them. And then the guards all go blind. And in the first 30 pages of the novel, everybody goes blind. So in their blindness, what do they do? They group into kind of gangs, and powerful gangs dominate weaker gangs, and gangs of men rape gangs of women, and they steal from one another and hoard food, and on and on. And it becomes this dystopic nightmare until suddenly the first guy's eyes come back, and then another and another. And they're so happy, they cry out and they hug each other, but awkwardly, because they've just done dreadful, dreadful things to each other. So they hug each other, but a little awkwardly, and then somebody says, why did we go blind? And why can we now see? And the narrator says, perhaps we didn't go blind. Perhaps we were blind. Seeing people who are blind, blind people who can see. And Sarah Margo means that as an allegory for us. We are blind people who can see. We are seeing people who are blind. And it's our responsibility to wake up and to see the world as it is and to try to understand it and try to act within it.